Hashburg Eclipse. If you look at the cover of the game, it looks like a fantasy game to me. I expect a wizard to pick out of the, one of those windows any times, any time. But no, this is an historical game. It depicts the decline of the Hashburg Empire in World War One. This is a sister game to a previous game published Victory Point Games, uh, that game being Ottoman, Ottoman um, Sunset, a game that I enjoyed very much when I played a couple of years ago. Uh, this is the sequel and also there are rules that allow you to combine that game with this one, but I haven't tried the two of them combined yet. I've had enough fun with this one as is, before, and I haven't felt any desire to modify things yet. This really tells you that this is a game that I enjoyed. Uh, it is a states of siege game. Uh, it belongs to a system that has been implemented in many games by Victory Point games. It is a solitaire game, even though the uh, version where you where you combine this game with Ottoman Sunset is a two-player game. The core game is a solitaire game. Um, I have the box version here. I believe the Ziploc version is available too. It comes, well, with the box, with this cover that you slip onto the box. There are two versions of the map, a cardboard one and a board one, which is sort of like a puzzle. Somehow, I don't know why, I prefer to play the game with the, with the, with the cardboard cardstock one. I don't know why. I like it, I like it as is. Here you have Vienna in the middle of the map and you have tracks that depart from it or converge towards it, it depends on how you look at things. And you have to protect Vienna. There will be markers representing enemy fronts and those markers are placed on those tracks. If either, if any of those fronts ever reach Vienna you lose the game immediately. At the beginning of the game only two enemy fronts are active more enemy fronts will activate during the game, trust me, that will happen. The game is card driven, there are three decks of cards, so you use only one of them at the beginning of the game, this one with the light blue band here. You flip a card at the beginning of each turn, you resolve the events on that card, and then if you haven't lost the game yet, you flip another one and you repeat. There is a card in here that will instruct you to add the second deck to this one, so you shuffle this one into the remaining cards of this one. There's a card in here that instructs you to add this deck to this one. And if you survive until the end of the deck, that is, if you flip and resolve all of the cards and you haven't lost the game by then, you win the game. That is the only way of winning the game, surviving the entire ordeal of World War I with all of its military and political complexities. If you survive that, you win the game. Otherwise, well, there are many ways in which you can lose the game. One way is, again, if an enemy front, which is represented by one of those markers, where markers will be here, if an enemy front ever reaches the zero space, Vienna, there, then you lose the game. There are also the ways of losing the game, though. There will be events that will affect national will. You have to keep track of national will constantly during the game, and you do it by using that track there. If the national will ever falls under minus five, you lose the game. Also, the country, the Austrian Grand Empire that you're trying to defend, is torn from the inside by ethnic rivalries. You have three main ethnicities, uh, we should call them groups, uh, and they start the game on this track here. Each is represented by a different counter on a different track. We have Czechs, Croats and Hungarians. During the game they will become increasingly disloyal to you. Every time that the loyalty worsens, you move the corresponding marker of the corresponding ethnicity by one space on its track towards the left. When it reaches the last space, then the ethnicity starts a revolt. You can have Hungarian revolt, Croat revolt, Czech revolt. When that happens, you also take this marker here and you place it on a specific a specific place on the map which I'm going to show you in a second that is a reminder that that ethnicity is in revolt and also 
the spot where you place that is a reminder of the military disadvantages that come from having a revolt from that group in that region. In the case, for example, you have a negative modifier on offensive against, offensives against the Carpathian and the Romanian fronts if the Hungarians, the Hungarians are in revolt. Uh, so that's bad. If all too many people revolt, well, if any people, if any of your ethnicities revolt, it's better already because of the negative modifiers. But also, the problem is that if all, th all three ethnicity are in revolt at the same time, you lose the game. Now, like in other games in the system, the core mechanics are all the same, are well known. If you played the games in the system, more or less, you know what happens here. You flip one of the cards, you resolve the effects that are described on the card, and then you receive a certain number of actions that you can spend in several ways, mainly to counteract the bad stuff that the game throws at you in the previous part of the card. Here there are potentially three types of effects that happen each turn. Um, that makes the game a little bit procedural. I found that there is, some, the, there is more bookkeeping in this game than there is in other uh, games in the system. You have to go through these phases, you receive your actions, which somehow sometimes are just one or two actions, then you have to uh, adjust tracks and count points on the map, you move to the next uh, card, you go through all of these phases, then you maybe resolve an action or two. Um, that may be seen as a negative, but actually I didn't find that to be too much of a problem because these phases are pretty um, are pretty fast to resolve. Uh, very often there are um, decisions that you have to make in when you're spending resources. Some cards will give you resources, will give you bonus markers that you have to decide whether or not you're spending in these phases here. Um, so there's still decisions to be made there or you see the result of previous decisions there. But the flow of the game is a little slower found than in other games in the system. However, it does without being necessarily negative, especially because all of these uh, cards, all of these events here, uh, portray a quite intense story. Um, a quite, quite good and, and pretty vivid narrative. I guess I've anticipated most of my conclusions here already. Back to what happens here. The first... Uh, thing that may happen is effects. There are several types of effects a, that may happen or no effect at all. A very common effect is to have to resolve a battle. These battles, these events, are represented by markers that you see there in that area and there's a marker for each corresponding battle on one, on one of these cards. It's pretty simple. When you have to resolve one of these battles, these are off-map battles. When you have to conduct one of these battles, you simply roll a d6 and you compare the result, which was a 1, with the number printed on the marker, which is also represented on the card. If you roll higher than the number, in this case for this battle before, you win the battle. Otherwise, if you roll lower, you lose the battle, and if you roll the same, the battle is a stalemate. Then, when you have the result, you look for the marker corresponding to that battle, and you put it on, the, on that area on the board, on the victories area, defeats area, or stalemates area, depending on the result of the battle. I had a 1, that was a defeat, then I placed the marker there. The resolution of those battles affects national will uh, later in the game at the end of each turn. That's what happens if you had to conduct a battle. During the game you also have chances, a chance uh, several times to spend actions to purchase modifiers, some modifier markers. These are pretty expensive because it costs two actions to purchase a single one. Then you place it on one of these three boxes here, Western Theater, Naval Theater, and Eastern Theater, and you have the modifier of plus one when you resolve a battle that uh, takes place in that theater of operations. For example, uh, I place a plus one marker there, then I put a plus one to my die roll 
when I'm resolving battles that belong to that uh, to that area. I can purchase up to two such markers per theater of operation. That's all the modifiers I can have. I cannot have more than those. Also, I can use those markers as reserve actions. That is, later in the game I can spend one of them, removing it permanently from that area, to receive an extra action. Once you have resolved the battles in that phase, if you have any markers that are on the board, the markers representing enemy fronts, advance. And the markers that advance are the ones indicated on the cards that you are resolving. In this case, for example, the Polish front advances, the Balkan and the Italian advance. Right now on the board I only have the Polish one, so I ignore the other two and I advance the Polish front. Um, as you can see, the Carpathian front has something a little unusual to it. Uh, there are these two markers that represent a fortress, which I'm not even trying to, to pronounce the name of it. The fortress has three steps, three levels of mm, health, let's call it that way. In other games uh, of the system, and even in this game, there are obstacles that you can place in the way of the enemies and when the enemies try to enter that space they have to roll a die and they have to roll very well to be able to enter the space. Not in this case, that fortress doesn't stop the enemies from entering that space if the cards instruct you to advance the Carpathian front into that space. But what that, what that fortress does is it makes it harder for the enemies to to progress, to move further. I assume that because some units of this front are left behind to siege their fortress, or maybe because they are afraid of the threat that this fortress can present to, to supply lines. Either way, when the Carpathian front is past that fortress, you have a plus one when you're attacking that front. However, for each turn at the end of which the Carpathian front marker is past that, is past the fortress, the fortress is reduced by one step. So from 3-3 three, three, you flip the marker to 2-3, then to 1-3, one, 1-3rd, three, three, and then the fortress is destroyed. Um, there are similar things in other places of the map, things, in, things that make uh, the tracks work in slightly different ways. There's a card, for example, that allows you to add a trench to the, to the Balkan front, a Bulgarian trench, and that will help you to slow down that front. The Italian front has a river here which is particularly hard to cross for the Italians. It is a permanent obstacle. The Italians need to roll uh, and to have to obtain a specific die roll in order to be able to pass that river. At the same time, however, uh, if you are attacking past that river, you're trying, if you're trying to push back the Italians past that river, or also from the box 4 to the box 5, you have to spend two actions. This is because the geography of the region makes it particularly, particularly hard to launch a powerful offensive. This works in your advantage, the Italians are on the offensive, they are trying to move towards you. On the other hand, it works against you if you are the one trying to push the Italians back. So it is likely that for at least part of the game, if not most of the game, the Italians will be just on the other side of the Isonzo River here, which is, makes puts, puts them kind of, uh, kind of close to where you don't want them to be. Uh, so there's a trade-off there. It is hard for them to advance past that area, but if they do, then they're immediately dangerously close to, uh, to Vienna, which of course is a liability. But to be able to really push them away far enough that you don't have to worry about them for a while, that's that's tough because uh, you have to spend a lot of actions. Now, oops, I just hit the camera. You advance the front, so then you may have to trigger one or more of these nationalities. When that is the case, the card instructs you about the the, the nationality or nationalities that you have to trigger. For example, in this case, the Hungarian. Some cards, here are the Croats. 
I'm getting them multiple times, sometimes all. I'm looking for a card that gives you a random activation. In, the, in which case, if you have a random nationality um, nationality being triggered, that is being checked for loyalty, you roll a die, you compare the result to this table here, and then you see which nationality you have to check. I suppose that we have to check the, the checks. Then to check it, you roll 86, and you have to roll uh, higher than the number printed there for the loyalty of that corresponding nationality, not to worsen. If you roll the same or less than, then the, the loyalty worsens by one step and you move the corresponding nationality, corresponding ethnicity by one space on its loyalty track. Then it's time for you to perform your actions about time. Uh, when it's time for you to use your actions, you can use them to attack an enemy front, you roll a d6, so you apply modifiers that may apply, um, negative modifiers, bonuses that you may get from the cards or from resources that you're spending. If your total result is higher than the printed number on the front, the front is pushed back by one step, otherwise the front stays where it is and you can spend as many actions as you want well, and have against a single front each turn. Another thing that you can do is to allocate resources to your off-map battles, to actions to purchase a modifier to place there. You can repair the fortress there if the fortress has been damaged, or you can try to influence national loyalty, that is, you can try to push back national loyalty markers towards the right side of the track. In order to do so, you can you spend an action, you roll a d6, and you need to roll equal to or higher than the marker, the number on the marker. At the end of each turn, you check the national will of, of, of your empire. In order to do so, you count each victory as a plus one, each defeat as a minus one, uh, stalemates are zero, each nationality in revolt is a minus one. Then you can see that many locations on the board have flags. If an enemy front is in, in a location with a flag or past that, then each of those flags that represents represent key territories that are now in the hands of the enemy, each such flag is a defeat, is a minus one. You tally the pluses, that come from, from victories and may come from other events, with uh, minuses you record the, uh, the, the, the end result here and again if it's uh, below minus 5 you lose the game immediately. This is one fine game. It is a game that is um, heavier and meatier than most victory point games I played, especially most uh, states of siege games. If not probably the most complex. This doesn't make it a very complex game overall. This is not advanced squad leader. I'm just saying that within this family here, I would say that we have a game that is a notch above the other ones in terms of complexity, uh, but also I think in terms of quality. I definitely like this game. This goes very close to the top of my favorite games in the State of Siege series. Uh, may not be for everybody because um, there is a little bit of bookkeeping that you have to do. Uh, Probably the thing that becomes a little problematic or that requires some extra thinking and slows down the game a little bit is to adjust the national will every single turn. Uh, I found that it is much easier if you simply adjust the national will as you go. I, my uh, enemies enter that city that has a flag that counts as a point against my national will. I'm not planning to attack uh, that front, then I lower the thing immediately. A revolt happened, then I lower the national will immediately. Uh, things like that. And then every two or three turns I just double check. And usually I have an adjustment of one or two in case I made a mistake here and there. So actually I didn't find it was strictly necessary to actually and really check the national will every turn. And if you get to a point, a single point from defeat, 
uh, then pretty much you know when you lost that extra point. So they're just ways of speeding up the process and just it becomes automatic. Still the pace of the game is a little procedural because of the potential two or three steps event that you have to do to to, to do what the board is doing against you. Uh, possible battles, uh, fronts, advance uh, and, uh, and national loyalties uh, worsen. This being said, I like this game. I like this game very, very much. The story tells is tight, is powerful, uh, is full of surprises, has a nice sense of, of increasing tension. It is not a game, say, that starts flat and then becomes hard all of a sudden. Uh, it it does gain momentum so the situation gets worse and worse but I find it I found it very involving very engaging from the inception uh, from the moment you start playing because you know how quickly things can go bad in other states of siege games you have one or two things that you have to worry about maybe a political collapse and a military collapse here you have three things that fight against you you have a uh, enemies from other nationalities that hate you, your people that don't trust you and, and, and that will lose the, the will to be with you, and then also you have ethnicities that don't like you and don't like each other. All of these factors are contributed towards the disintegration of the Austrian, of the Austrian Hungarian Empire and you are that empire trying not to, to be destroyed, to be shredded to smithereens by the war. A fun game. If you can take a little bit of procedure, uh, this is a game that definitely is worth playing. It's longer and more intense than most states of siege games that I played, but I found it entirely rewarding. I found it really, this is a game with a strong narrative, a strong sense of history, tough decisions, a lot of resources that you can allocate, that means a lot of decisions that you can make which counterbalance the sense of randomness that comes from the cards and all the dice rolls. Overall, this is one of my favorite States of Siege games. Powerful theme, very interesting theme, well implemented, strong mechanics, overall a very solid game, which I recommend to anyone who is interested in World War I and or Solitaire games.